Uh, so this is just like a quick introduction, very top level overview of just like 3D printing and the 3D printing industry and kind of like where we're at and maybe where it's going. So just a little bit of introduction about myself. Uh, my name is James O'Brien. I am a Mac grad, 2008. And this building was just as crappy back then as it is now. <laughs> um, I graduated from uh, mechanical engineering, specializing in like thermal fluids uh, aerospace. So I've been in like the defense aerospace and power industry basically since then. Uh, I've been 3D printing uh, both like professionally and just kind of a, like a hobby for about like five years now. Um, so this is just uh, some collections of some just projects I've done. So I've done a, a scaled gas turbine power plant for a client. Um, I'm right now currently building uh, some Fallout armor from uh, video game Fallout. And I uh, made a baby, baby mobile Super Mario themed for um, a baby shower just this past summer. Um, I myself, I cosplay as uh, Boba Fett from Star Wars. Uh, I'm part of the 501st official Star Wars costuming group. Uh, so his costume is not 3D printed per se, but all the little like gadgets, knobs, gizmos, those were all 3D printed. Uh, last summer, uh, we built a full-size uh, animatronic of Jabba the Hutt. Um, so his eyes, uh, his internal gear mounts, uh, those were all 3D printed. Uh, so he's a great example of just using 3D printing and like a mixed medium project where, you know, this is 3D printed, this might be steel, this might be latex. So it's just a great way of just to kind of combine everything and uh, get something kind of cool working. So our agenda today, just do a quick overview of 3D printers. Uh, we'll talk about the history of 3D printing very briefly. We'll talk about applications of 3D printing in the industry. We're going to talk about like the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we're going to talk about 3D Printing Canada, our sponsor today. And we're going to talk about, you know, buying your first 3D printer. Like what should you look for? What, what kind of market do you want to get into? So the term 3D printing covers a wide spectrum of machines. Back in the day, these were kind of known as rapid prototyping machines. But now we're seeing them less as a prototyping machine, but they're becoming more like actually finished good machines. One thing all these machines do have in common though is how they make things. And they make things using additive manufacturing. So as opposed to subtractive manufacturing, which is like casting, machining, milling, uh, additive manufacturing, we add material to build things. So you start with your first layer, as you all know, you make another layer, you make a few hundred more layers, thousands of layers perhaps, and eventually you have a finished product. That's how additive manufacturing works. Types of printers, stereolithographic apparatuses are just commonly known as SLA. So these are like the first 3D printers still used today though. Uh, they use a liquid resin bath and they use a UV radiation uh, laser. Um, and this uh, liquid resin is a photopolymer. So it cures, it hardens when it's hit by UV radiation. Uh, so basically you have a bath with just a very small amount of fluid. The laser goes around, it cures, and then they just raise the bath level a bit, do another level, and you just keep doing that until eventually you have a solid part. SLS machines, uh, very similar to SLA, they do use a laser, but instead of a liquid resin, they use a powder. Um, now this powder can be plastic or it can actually be metal. So this is how most metal printers work. Uh, so you just have a bed of a very fine dust of a powder. Laser will come around, it'll melt this powder. So the freshly melted uh, powder will then fuse with your previous layer. And then fused deposition modeling or FDM. So these are the, when we talk about 3D printing day-to-day -day stuff, these, this is typically what it is. These are the machines you guys worked on today. Uh, they work by using a filament or a spool material that goes through like a hot nozzle, similar to like a glue gun. And basically you just go around, you melt yourself a hot layer, and then you go up, and then you melt a new layer on your previous layer. A uh, history of 3D printing. So 3D printing, it's like the best thing in the last few years, or is it? There's actually a good chance that it's actually much older than you are. It's actually older than I am. Um, actually started back in the 80s with the SLA machine. Um, but at this time, only the biggest companies could afford it. You know, we're talking about like GE, Siemens, like only the top three companies could afford it. Um, and this was basically uh, SLA technology. Um, Shortly after, we see SLS and FDM technology uh, move in. This is around the 90s. Also during this time, obviously, we see huge advancements in computers, software, and of course, the internet. All this needed for like the foundation of 3D printing today. And then in the 2000s, now that all these patents have expired, we kind of see FDM technology just kind of explode into the market. Because now any company can make a printer, anybody can make a printer now. And then this is where you see the you know, do-it-yourself kits and all the online packages you can buy. So what we see today with printers today, 
Uh, we see increased intelligence, ease of use, more reliability and less failures. And, and this statement is true even just like two years ago. The printers we had two years ago are half as dumb as the printers we have today. And it's just gonna get better and better and they're getting smarter and easier to use. Uh, we're seeing new, stronger material getting developed. Um, the library of materials is huge. Back in the day, it was like one, ABS, and then maybe it was PLA. Now there's dozens of materials that you can use. We're seeing more non-FDM printers move into the consumer market, like SLA or like resin printers. Uh, they're actually quite affordable. You yourself can buy a resin printer. And uh, we're seeing more and more finished goods being made by printers. So as I said earlier, they're originally prototyping machines, but now, like right now in the aerospace industry, we basically print something and it goes right on an airplane. Um, there's a cleaning process, but it goes right on the airplane. It's not a prototyping part anymore. What we're seeing is being able to 3D print will be an asset in the workforce. It's gonna be basically a requirement, you know, do you know this, you know Microsoft, you know how to do this, do you know how to 3D print? So it is gonna become an asset in the workforce. So applications of 3D printing. So concept models. This was the stuff we were kind of working on today, concept models. Very quick, very crude, but gets the job done. You could spend a little bit more time and improve the quality of your concept models. This is great for when you're doing like meetings or, or with clients, investors, uh, business partners, other vendors. This ranges uh, from a whole bunch of different types, from buildings to more hardware cameras. With concept models, they don't necessarily have to be functional, so they don't have to be strong. Um, so there's actually sand printing, which is a kind of new technology where you can do colored sand and you can get a full rainbow of colors. And this is great for really presentable and conceptual models. Auto aerospace industry, so these were the first people to kind of jump into 3D printing, not just for prototypes, but as I said earlier, for actually finished goods. And we're able to just take apart, print it, and it gets right installed on an airplane. So the part on the right is I think one of the first parts to be 3D printed and to be flyable, allowed to be on an airplane. It's a GE fuel nozzle. Um, big thing in the 3D and aerospace industry. Uh, medical. So one thing 3D printing really excels at is like small batches, small quantities, or like very specialized customized parts. This is why 3D printing is really great for this kind of stuff. And it just really took off in that kind of market. So traditional manufacturing is, is about mass production. You need a thousand of something, two thousands of something. But with medical, every body's different. Everybody's different. Everyone's different shapes, different sizes, plus every injury is different. It's impossible to make a thousand knees for a particular injury on a particular size of person. It doesn't make sense. So that's where 3D printing really excels in. So we see it with like prosthetics and uh, medical devices, braces, it's just really exploded in that market. Chemical. So concept models don't necessarily have to be real physical things, um, but you can actually print abstract um, ideas, concepts, things that might not exist in the real life, or maybe they exist, but they're so small you can't see them, but you can kind of blow them up, make something physical and print it so people can actually see how they work and how they bond. Uh, so you can actually print molecules and complex carbon chains and you can see how maybe molecules both work or bond with one another. Um, fashion and apparel. So like thanks to development of softer thermoplastics, rubbers like NinjaFlex and TPU, T P TPE, um, you can now print flexible materials. So not only does this have an engineering use such as like tires or grips or like belts or pulleys, but it's actually moved into the fashion industry too. So now they can make wearable, flexible clothes, items, uh, shoes. Uh, Nike a few years ago just 3D printed an entire shoe. Um, there's companies now that will 3D print shoes that fit you. So they will 3D scan your foot and you'll have a shoe designed to fit you. Space and maritime. So due to the port portability and size of like typical 3D printers, this opens the door for space and maritime travel where like getting a part, if a part breaks, trying to get a replacement to site could take weeks or if you're out in space, like it's impossible. It's, it's basically a death situation, life and death situation. So 3D printing found a way into this kind of market where if a tool breaks, you just fix it. You just print yourself a new one. Now 3D printing parts aren't necessarily the strongest, but it doesn't matter if it breaks again, you just print a new one. So this really opened up the world where you could be out in the middle of the sea or you could be on a different planet. And if you need a part, you can just design it, print it and make it like we did today with obviously a little bit better, uh, stronger materials. And so this is, this is true. This was printed, this ratchet was printed in space. 
And of course, film, toys, and props. So anybody who looks into cosplays or uh, toys or replicas or, or anything in, in that uh, you know, nerdy convention stuff, uh, 3D printing is big there because people can now make costumes, they can make their favorite props, their favorite characters. Um, it's also great for toys, uh, small figurines, Warhammer, all that kind of stuff. So it's really great for the uh, hobbyists and also uh, professional game designers, as well as the film industry. So a lot of movie props these days are just 3D printed. Uh, once again, basic manufacturing methods, they rely on mass manufacturing. And when you're just doing one movie and you only need a few spacesuits, you don't need a thousand. This is where 3D printing really comes into play. Um, it was also used in animation for uh, claymation figures. Uh, I think some of their faces and eyes were all 3D printed. So conclusion, while 3D printing has exploded, uh, it can literally be found in almost in every type of industry from concept models to uh, working prototypes to actually finished goods. Uh, it really doesn't matter what kind of field of work you end up with, you most likely will have to work with a 3D printer. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution. So we're currently kind of in the midst of a fourth industrial revolution. This is like the maker revolution. Um, right now, the combination of high computing power, um, the internet of things, uh, advanced software, AI and robotics, and of course, additive manufacturing, uh, a single individual can design, analyze, test, and produce and sell everything on their own. Uh, we don't just see this in engineering, but we're also seeing this in, in other industries such as entertainment, YouTube. A single person can make millions of dollars just running a YouTube industry. Uh, we see it also in programming with Steam. There are millions and millions of games there on Steam. Every day a thousand indie games are released. So single people or small teams can actually produce lots of things very fast and very efficiently. So never before have we seen such tools been like this cheap, this accessible, and to have, the, uh, and have any individual, including like 3D printing, um, manufacturing. Um, so a decent printer these days, capable of doing most things, only costs like 500 bucks. Um, starter printers around 200 bucks. Um, wouldn't go there if you're actually planning on making a business case out of it, but for 500 bucks, you can get yourself a really good printer, capable of almost printing anything. So buying your first printer, so like there's lots of printer brands, there's companies, there's different model versions. Honestly, the options can get overwhelming, um, especially if you, you know, dive deep in the internet web and Alibaba, you're gonna see all these kits from here and there and it, it can get overwhelming and it can be, you, you'll get lost. So when buying your first printer, it's best to just think about your application and how you kind of want to use it. So you, it, the very bottom are like the minis. These are small, very desktop. The print bed is usually very small, only about six inches. Um, pros, they're very cheap, usually like 200 bucks. Um, fairly easy to use. Cons, however, they, it is a very small bed. Um, usually the bed's unheated with these versions. So you're kind of limited to only PLA and even PLA sometimes has a hard time sticking to cold beds. And, um, well, as I said, you can only print PLA. So you're going to run into some limitations pretty quickly if you want to be a serious designer. The next level are like the i3s. The i3s are like the bread and butter of the 3D printing industry, especially for FDMs. Um, these machines are reasonable. These are the machines we worked on over the weekend. Decent sized bed, about 200 millimeters, maybe um, eight, nine inches around that size. So a good size. Um, they can handle almost every material on the market. And if it can't handle a particular material, like, like polycarbonate, more the really tough advanced materials, there's usually a very cheap upgrade kit you can get if you really want to print like polycarbonate. But other than that, it can print like 80, 90%, usually right out of the box, if not 100% materials. Um, they definitely have a heated bed um, and they can print, uh, as I said, most materials. Some of them might have an enclosure, um, but that's usually just a slightly higher up level. And they're reasonably priced. For 500 bucks, you can get a really good printer. Um, the Enders we're using today, they're about three something. And that's really good for 300, because you compare the quality of that and what you can get with that compared to the Mini we just saw for 200. For an extra 150, it was, it was, I was impressed. I did not like Enders up to today. I was very impressed with what Enders did. Uh, the Wen Hao Duplicator. So he's an i3 class. Uh, reasonably priced around 600 bucks very high quality, they have a direct feeder so they can print flexible materials such as rubbers. 
Um, they have a nice uh, touch screen. Uh, the ones we were using earlier had the uh, dial knob. So these are really good mid-class, I-class printers. And then of course the Enders. These were the ones we're using today. Um, reasonably good printers for a really great price. Like I said, they're using the, the turn dial, so it's not as advanced as the touch screen. Um, they do have a bowed-in feeder, which can make it difficult to print rubbers or flexible materials. But if you have no interest in printing rubbers or anything flexible, these were great for plastics, as we saw today. Your next class are like the I3 larges or the super sizes. So these just kind of came out in the last few years. There's been a huge push for all these bigger, bigger beds. And then, like I said, in the last year or so, a lot of companies came out with a super size. So we have the Creality's. We also, once again, have the Wenhels. Very large bed for a reasonable price. So the Creality Pro, reasonable price, 900,000 bucks, large bed. These are, these are 400, 500 millimeters very large. Um, the only problem is with such a large bed, although it's heated, it's very hard to get good heat distribution with the Creality. So that's only the flaw they have. Um, the D9 costs a little bit more. This, uh, this was on display downstairs. Um, good price, a little expensive, 1200 uh, But once again, you have a very large bed. This comes in 300, 400, and 500 millimeters. Heated, it heats up very well. It also has auto leveling, which is a very nice feature, so you don't have to manually level. Um, and it has direct drive, so this can handle the flexible rubber materials. After that, we're going into the semi-professional class. So these guys are usually, they're fully enclosed, which is great for more advanced materials that are kind of heat sensitive, like ABS. So this helps keep a nice constant working temperature. Uh, they usually have some type of auto leveling device. Um, they also usually have dual nozzle. This is really great because one nozzle can drop support material and this would be like a soluble material. This material will dissolve in like water. And then your other nozzle will print your actual part. So now you don't have to clean or worry about cleaning or cutting out support material. You just leave your part overnight in a bath of water and it just dissolves away. It's, it's an amazing feature. And of course, very high quality prints. These things can go very small levels of like 0.05 millimeters uh, layer height. So very high quality. Con, however, they are very expensive though. Anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000, depending on the size we're getting at. And of course, resin printers. So these have just come in the last few years as well. Um, resin has superior quality over FDM. You cannot see the layer heights with resins. These are great for small figurines. Um, very small, high detail fe features. Uh, jewelry, um, they would cast, they would print jewelry out of resin and then they can cast it right there out of like gold or silver. So very high quality. Um, these printers are quite reasonable, 700,000 bucks, just slightly more than an I3. Uh, however, cons, they are much smaller print beds. They're usually about like four or five inches and you got to handle resin. Resin is they're usually toxic, they're very fumy, so you have to do take some precautions. Being a well-ventilated area, you need to wear gloves when handling resin. So you just have to understand that before getting into the whole resin industry. Thank you for your time. Uh, special thanks to McMaster University, faculty and staff, as well as to the uh, other sponsors. I uh, hope you guys learned a lot this weekend. Um, if you have any questions, please hit myself up or Chris or any of the other guys from 3D Printing Canada. And honestly, we hope to see you all in our store one day because the more printing, the better for everybody. Not just for the store, but for society as a whole. Like, we could work together and we could create amazing things once we put our minds together. So, that's one thing I love about 3D printing, just the, uh, the, the club, the socialness of it. I just love it. So, hope to see you guys all there. Thank you.